book of James tonight, uh, James the first chapter, and we're going to look at verses uh, 5 and 6, and we're in the um, strength for stressful times. This is the uh, series of lessons that I'll be sharing with you for the next several weeks. I know we had spent a lot of time in the book of James previously, but uh, this falls the text tonight and the subject tonight, I thought we'd go back there again for the subject that I have for you this evening. The Bible says, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask God that giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith not wavering, for he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. Can I read verse 7? For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. My subject tonight is simply asking why. Asking why. I've gleaned that people are an inquisitive bunch. Maybe you have too. People like to be in the know. They like to know what's going on. And they will ask questions. Why are you doing this? Or why are you doing that? How does this connect with that? And there is a difference in being naturally inquisitive and naturally nosy. Help me somebody. I've also found that most people tell you what they want you to know. You don't have to say anything. I believe that God doesn't mind our inquisitiveness. Many of us were taught coming up that we are not to ask God why. And I do want to paraphrase this or really put this in perspective in saying that I don't believe we should ask God why in terms of, of it happening to us and not to somebody else. Are you with me? In other words, common problems are common to all of us. And if you're breathing, if you're alive, you're going to have your share of problems. And asking God why me and not somebody else, I don't think is a fair question to ask of God. But beloved, God is not intimidated by your honest questions. Are you with me this evening? God is not intimidated by your quest for knowledge. For the Bible says, if any man lacks wisdom... Let him what? Let him ask God, who gives to all men liberally. And the Bible says, upbraideth not. Is that right? God said, come to me and ask why. Matter of fact, you, you know you receive wise counsel from God over and above any wise counsel that you're able to get from anybody else. Often we ask the wrong people the right questions. Yeah, yeah you, you, you are not going to, I'm going to preach this lesson tonight. God is not afraid of you. God is not insecure about his sovereignty. He's not envious of man or afraid that his position or his power or his authority is going to be jeopardized by you or anybody else knowing a lot of things. God can handle it. And God says, go ahead and ask. Seek and ye shall find. Knock and the door shall be open. Ask, is that right? And it shall be given unto thee. You, we, we should remember that questions must be followed by faith, okay? We're not excused of this responsibility. For God declares that anything that in our life that is not rooted in or brought about by faith in God is sin. For without faith, it is impossible to please God. Is that right? And the Bible says that the just shall live by faith. Someone says of faith that faith is the oil that takes the friction out of living. 
Someone said, faith turns liability into assets and stumbling, stumbling blocks into stepping stones. When you begin to have faith, your load will get heavy, but your knees won't buckle. You'll get knocked down, but you won't get knocked out. Help me, somebody. Let me help you with this so you don't confuse it. When I talk about faith, I'm not talking about some kind of feel-good confession that's rooted in humanism. Saying that I'm okay and you're okay. I'm not talking about manipulation of the scriptures to formulate a recipe for success. That cake won't rise. That's charismatic witchcraft and I don't hang out with witches. When I say faith, I'm talking about an absolute a trusting, uncompromising trust in Almighty God. It is a faith that knows that success in life is not because you learned your times table and were able to carry the one. It's faith that says, I will lift my eyes to the hills from which cometh my help. I understand my help comes from the Lord. The supreme principle of faith is the product of God's love toward us. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments. And his commandments are not grievous or burdensome. 1 John 5, 2 and 3. We, we often only trust people that we know love us. People who have our best interests at heart. With agape love, the recipient's welfare is always the giver's number one concern. Knowing this makes it easier for us to trust Almighty God, the one that loved you while you were still out in your sins unworthy of love. His never leaves us. His is a hope that we can hold on to. Our hope makes us not ashamed because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us. There's a problem tonight. There's a problem tonight with many Christians. We are far too impatient. Now don't put me in the refrigerator tonight. No, don't it's, it's cold enough outside already and the temperature is dropping so don't put me don't put me in the ice box uh, tonight we are far too impatient if God doesn't speak in the first five minutes we declare that perhaps God is not talking to us tonight we get up shake ourselves off and move on we don't have the tenacity that the old timers had you remember what the old timers had. They had something that we don't see today. Unlike the great cloud of witnesses, we have come become a popcorn generation. Help me somebody. Quick, fast, and in a hurry. We've deleted and erased in our minds those passages of scriptures that command us to wait on God during turbulent, troubling, and unsure times. The testing of your faith, the Bible says, produces patience. But let patience work itself out. Let it have its what? It's perfect work. That you may be what? Complete. That you may be perfect. That you may be complete. Lacking nothing. You might ask tonight, Brother Max, why does it take God so long to answer my prayers? My goodness, I've been praying about the same thing over and over and over again. I, I, I turned in a prayer card last Sunday night and and I'm still waiting for that prayer from last Sunday night to be answered. I would answer you why you need to keep waiting on God. And I don't have all of the answers because I'm still waiting on some of mine to be answered. Y'all don't hear me tonight. But I, but I think I tell you tonight that the key to understanding this idea of patience is we must let patience have perfect work. Patience, watch this, is not patience until patience has been put to the test and worked itself into maturity. So unless, unless patience has had a chance to work, you, you're not going to be patient. What are you waiting for? What, what, what is it that, that you are waiting for beyond the building? 
beyond the building. You got some other things going on in your life. What are you waiting on tonight? Think about it. What is it that you are, have been praying to God about? And while you're thinking about that, I want to remind you of what God told his prophet Habakkuk. In Habakkuk 2, 2 and 3, at the time when the prophet was at his most despondent, because of what he had seen and what he had experienced, he was at a low point in his life. And God said, write the vision and make it plain. Make it plain, Habakkuk, on tablets, that he may run who reads it. For the vision is yet for an appointed time. But he says, but at the end of it, it will speak and it will not lie. Though it tarries, watch this. Though, though it tarries, he says what? He says, wait for it because it will surely come. It will not tarry. They would often take a tablet and they would write on the tablets and they would place the tablet in the public square so that those that walked by the public square while they were moving to and fro could stop and glance at what the tablet had to say. Are you with me tonight? Even those in a hurry could read as they hastened by. Watch this. Patience, contrary to popular belief, is not the same thing as waiting. Oh boy. Waiting is passive posture. But patience is an active principle. Waiting by itself, it, it, it no means a guarantee of receiving the promise that God has for your life. I'm going to explain this. Patience must be exercised in the wait. Are you with me? If just waiting were all there was in receiving the promise, the five virgins in the Bible who were waiting on the bridegroom and were caught without oil in their lamps would have been ready at the Lord's coming if it was all about just sitting down, sitting back with your legs crossed and waiting. They could have marched right on in there. Are you with me? All right. Now, and the Hebrews who came out of Egypt would have entered the promised land. Patience is not just sitting back with your arms folded and saying, I'm just waiting on God and not doing nothing. And not doing nothing. Patience is based on the scriptural principle of persistence and perseverance. Patience also does not come by just praying alone. Lord, give me patience. And then patience falls out of the sky. It doesn't happen like that. Is that right? For the reason that you have prayed for patience is indicative of the fact that you don't have patience. Is that right? Amen, somebody. Ah, and that you need patience. A prayer for patience is only an acknowledgement that you have a lack of patience. And God will grant your request, but he will not grant that request supernaturally. It is not that easy when you're just praying for patience and all of a sudden you have patience. Even Isaiah 40 that speaks of those that wait on the Lord is not talking about a silent wait, being still and sitting by the baptismal pool singing nobody knows the trouble that I see. The word used wait is a word that is for those that are hoping for those that are hoping, those that wait on the Lord, those that are trusting in the Lord, those that are, are expecting, those that are looking forward to something, when you ask God for patience, you only get it as a byproduct of something else the Lord sends your way. Usually it's tribulation. That's the byproduct. It's the tribulation that, that builds the hope. Are you with me? That, that gives you something. Tribulation, there, there's absolutely no other God-given way to grow the fruit of, the, of, the, of patience through other than going through some things. Tribulation, what is it? What is it? What does it mean? Is it affliction? Does it mean that I'm going to have to suffer? That's absolutely what it means. Tribulation means all of these and other undesirable, unwelcome things, but without exercising patience, you would not be able to receive the full counsel of the Lord. 
Nor will you see the vision of God in your life. In all things, there is a process by which God operates. We ask for strength, and God send us difficult situations. Amen? We, we pray for wisdom, and God provides us with problems so that we can come up with some solutions that make us wise. We ask for prosperity. Lord, I, I want to be rich. I, I want prosperity. We ask for prosperity, and God gives us talent, gives us thought, gives us vision, gives us creativity and wisdom to be able to do what you need to do for what you prayed for. Amen, somebody? We ask for a favor, and God gives us a responsibility. A large percentage of our success is the result of our eating the bread of adversity and drinking the bitter water of affliction. The genius of success is to be able to see the good that hides behind every situation. And that's a smart person. That's a wise, in that's a wise individual. Did that happen by me just stepping backwards and coming on? Did somebody do that? All right. A pessimist. A pessimist sees obstacles in his opportunities. Are you with me? In other words, when there's an opportunity, they don't see the good in the opportunity. Opportunity all hitting them all upside the head. All upside the head. There's opportunity. And the person is saying, ouch, my head is hurting. Are you with me? But an optimist sees opportunities in their obstacles. Here's a problem. Let me think about this. Let me pray to God on this and see how I'm going to deal and tackle this obstacle. One thing I know, I'm not going to turn around. I'm going to climb this mountain one way or another. I love the 23rd Psalm, don't you? The Lord, the what? The, the Bible says what? The Lord is what? I know we know that verse. The Lord is my what? My shepherd I shall not want. In it you find the words of a man who reminisces about a time when he was a shepherd boy. He looks back on it with fondness and relates to the care and the concern of God. But shepherd's work was not easy work. There was danger involved. Loneliness is involved in shepherd's work. Long hours and unfavorable conditions. And still it's an anthem of grace. It shouts with joy from the heart of a man who's overflowing with love and gratitude in his heart. The scene is a pasture. Are you with me? And we are his sheep. In verse 5, the scene is a banquet and God is the host. His people are the guests. In verse 6, the scene is our eternal home and God is the father and we are his children. The pasture becomes the table and the banquet room becomes the eternal home. When questions like why dominate our thinking, I, I, I will think more about what I know than what I don't know. I think that's a good premise to follow, isn't it? Maybe I concentrate more on what I do know more than what I don't know because if I focus on what I don't know, I'll just become more discouraged. But if I can concentrate on what I do know and I do know that the Lord is my shepherd, and because I know the Lord is my shepherd, I know that I shall not want, even though I don't know what's going to happen in the future, I'm not going to concentrate on that. I'm going to keep focusing on what? I know the Lord will take care of me. The good shepherd. What does the good shepherd do? The good shepherd leads his sheep. He's not a driver. He's a leader. He's always out front. The good shepherd does what? feeds his sheep. He's the bread of heaven. Feed me till I want no more. The good shepherd, don't let the sheep go out and get, get tangled up. The good shepherd protects his sheep. One day when David was a shepherd boy, you know the story, a bear came out of the wilderness to attack the sheep. With his club, David stood between the sheep and the bear and then slayed the bear. On another occasion, a lion came out of the thicket to attack the sheep. David, with his club, went between what? The sheep and the lion and was able to slay the lion. Come on, church. Jesus Christ, who is the good shepherd, took his club, the cross, and stood between his sheep and sin. Satan, death, and the grave. He literally died for the salvation of his sheep. The good shepherd gave his life completely for his sheep. This I do know, 
and I feel more comfortable talking about what I do know than spending more time talking about what I don't know. I know he wants to protect me and I'm grateful that he had the power to lay down his life for us but also had the power to take it up again. The good shepherd understands his sheep. Something else I know, I know that he loves me and he loves me, you. He has a shepherd's eye. He sees our need. Unlike others who have to wave to get attention, God knows what you need. He has a shepherd's strength to deliver you, a shepherd's faithfulness and will never leave you. He has a shepherd's tenderness, gives you personal attention. Him that cometh unto me, I will no wise cast out. So come to him tonight. There's somebody here tonight that has a care. Somebody here tonight that has a concern. Let your questions be turned into exclamation marks of praise. Are you a good sheep? Do you trust your shepherd? Do you obey your shepherd? Be a good sheep tonight. And you can't be a good sheep unless you listen to the good shepherd. Oh, I wish I had some time tonight. Each of us uh, who name the name of Christ should pray that we might be a good sheep even as God is a good shepherd. If you're not in Jesus Christ, Jesus said, I am the door. Isn't that right? If any man enter, he shall be saved. He shall go in and out and he shall find pasture. Jesus has the keys and you must enter him through obedience to his command. Faith, repentance, and confession and completing your obedience to him in the waters of baptism. And then you can sing, oh, happy day. The day Jesus washed my sins away. Maybe you're here tonight and you're concentrating more on the things that you don't know than on the things that you do know. I stopped by tonight to encourage your spirit. As you leave here tonight, there are a lot of things that are on the table for which you're asking questions. Amen. But focus on what you do know. And after a while, what you don't know will be answered sooner or later. Jesus is the answer for life's greatest questions. Let us demonstrate patience in our waiting, Holgate, and through every situation, whether it's good or not so good, we must understand that it will be good for us if we let patience have its perfect work. Mm. I say amen to that myself. Maybe you're here tonight and it's your desire to, to be a stronger Christian. It is your desire tonight to walk more by faith than you are doing by sight. You need God's word for that. You need prayer. You need to stay in the book. And you need the encouragement of your brothers and sisters tonight. Somebody here has a question.